to Mamby Pamby Land, where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jack wagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike. I'm online and I am live with you today. Uh, if you were listening there at the before the broadcast, was talking a little bit about Ellen G. White. Uh, the first book I ever read by her, it was simply E.G. White. And I didn't know I was reading some woman's book. And I thought, man, this is good stuff. This is like Bible prophecy stuff. Man, this is like really good. <sighs> A bunch of lies is what it was. And um, one of our good followers who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, sent me um, one of the books that he didn't burn. Uh, it was a copy of the early writings of Ellen White. And uh, I appreciate that. I look forward to, uh, to kind of going through that. Because it's in, it's in those books that she comes out with where she got her doctrine from. She didn't get it from the Bible. She did not get Sabbath-keeping obedience from the Bible. She didn't. She got it from an angel, quote-unquote, from heaven, who delivered unto her another gospel and as such paul said that it's cursed i curse thee ellen white so um if you know anybody seventh day adventist um just remind them of that ask them if they know where ellen white got her doctrine from ask them this Ask them where it says in the Bible that we must go to church only on one day of the week and we cannot go to church on any other day of the week. Ask that question. And I had a lady that um, started following our ministry and she was Seventh-day Adventist. And she called me one morning and she said, uh, you know, I, I, I love you, Pastor Mike. I, I just think, uh, you know, you've got some good stuff, but I, I just wonder why you go to church on Sunday and uh, don't follow the Sabbath and all this. And I said, if you can show me a verse that demands that I must worship in church service only on one day a week, and cannot worship any other day of the week, I will gladly submit to it. And you know what? She said, I can't. She admitted it. She was honest. And after that, she just rejected Seventh-day Advent Adventism. Uh, she has now died. I believe she's gone on to be with the Lord. And hallelujah, praise the Lord for that. Uh, I'm going to keep going the way I was going. I'm, I'm having fun with it. Um, the Bible numbers in the Genesis chapter and what they mean. Uh, we were looking at Genesis chapter 4 last week, and I want to pick up Genesis 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, but probably, probably not today. But anyway, let's uh, let's do this. Let's put it up on the screen for you. Let me do that and press that so we don't get the feedback. And there it is up on the screen. Hallelujah. Let's go to Genesis chapter 5. And 
Um, some of you have probably heard me say this before, but I, I was convinced that the number five had something to do with the rapture, the translation. And, and I'm right on that. I'm not wrong about that. But someone said that they could see that the number five was related to death. And I went, <laughs> oh, they are so wrong. Man, they're so wrong. They just don't know what I know. And then, then I got to thinking about it. And I got to reading the scripture and I went, I think they're right. So let's look at it. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him male and female, created he them, not him, male and female. God did not understand this. God did not create Adam as an androgynous figure, being half female and half male. God did not do that. That is a lie. Anybody says that lie, there's a reason behind it. And I believe it's because I believe the Antichrist is going to be an androgynous God. Male and female, both. Like the spirits coming up out of Revelation chapter 5, or Revelation chapter 9 at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. And I think it connects to this passage here. Male and female created he them. In other words, God did not remove the feminine part out of Adam, the Bible does not say that. And if you say the Bible says that, I want to see the verse where the Bible says that. All the Bible says was that God took a rib from Adam and formed the woman out of the rib that he had taken from Adam and brought Eve unto Adam and the two became one flesh. So, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam, which is why the woman takes on the man's last name. Lisa Leonard became Lisa Hoggard. Took her a while to, when she was writing checks, I, she had to scratch through a lot for the first few days. Took her a little while to get used to the fact that she woke up and went, what did I do? <laughs> I married Mike Hoggard. Oh, no. Anyway, um, called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now, Adam lived 130 years, begat a son in his own likeness, after his image. This is after Cain and Abel. A picture of the gospel where... The evil one kills the holy one. The one whose sacrifices are accepted versus the one whose sacrifices are not accepted. So anyway, um, there has to be another seed now raised up. Adam's 130 years and beget a son in his likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So we have Adam mentioned here, and then we have Adam mentioned here, we have Adam mentioned here, and we have Adam mentioned here in the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth for 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters, other ones. So when people ask you, uh, yeah, where did, uh, where did uh, Seth get his wife? He took a sister. He took a sister. Now, the genetics were pure at that time. And obviously God allowed for that to take place. 
so that they could um, multiply and replenish the earth. It's what they did. In the days of Adam, after he begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So we have Adam mentioned one, deux, trois, quoi. I don't know five in French. Five. Five times. In the first five verses, and when it says, and, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So Adam's mentioned five times in Genesis 5, and he dies. An interesting, and you can say what you want. You can say what you want. I will give you a fact. And you can do what you want to do with the fact, but you cannot alter the fact. Notice that it starts out, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And we know the Bible talks about the first Adam and the last Adam or the second Adam. The last Adam became a living soul or the, the first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam, um, I can't remember what it says. But anyway, so if I go and Adam lived 930 years and he died. So if I just happen to go to the very beginning of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, it starts out the same way, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, that puts me in the 930th chapter of the Bible. And I think I'm, I think my iPad's busted. That's what I think that's what it is. I think my iPad's busted. Something's wrong here. I don't know. I may not ever get sound effects ever again. It's going to be a sad day in Dodge. I don't ever get sound effects again. But anyway, that's a fact. That is a fact. You have two books, Old and New Testament, and two Adams, and, well, to you too. And you have two books, Old and New Testament, two Adams, and... The first Adam lived 930 years, and the book of the generations of Adam are, met, are mentioned in the Bible. And in the very beginning of the New Testament, we have the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, and it just happens to be the exact same chapter number as the age of Adam, 930 years, and he died. So the Old Testament takes you from the first Adam to the second Adam. Boom. And there he is right there. Now that is a fact. You can't deny it. If you tried, you can, you can count it some other way. But it's still going to add up the exact same way that Matthew chapter 1 is the 930th chapter of the Bible and Adam lived 930 years. I just, they, people say that, um, well, God, uh, they didn't add the chapter and verses until later. Well, what does that mean? Let me, let me illustrate something for you that I thought about and I don't have an answer to it but it's an interesting question Jesus had the opportunity while he was down here on this earth 33 years the Jews knew that he was educated because they were fascinated by his teaching because he they said how how knoweth he letters being ignorant they didn't understand how he knew how to read and write but he did. 
how many books, when Jesus was on this earth, how many actual books did he physically write? Zero. Even when he shows up to John on the Lord's day when John is in the spirit praying and he hears this voice as the sound of a trumpet, he turns around and he sees Christ behind him and here's Jesus and he's got seven letters he wants written to the seven churches which are in Asia, but he doesn't write them. He commands John to write them. So God never wrote any of his word. He spoke it to those holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and they wrote down what the Holy Ghost told them to write down. So, while I know for a fact God did not write any of the Bible, and it is true that the Bible was written by men, it is that statement, you can't stop there. The Bible was written by holy men of God, and they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But God's not done. Because when it's time to translate his word, God oversees the translation. That's a gift of the Spirit. The interpretation of unknown tongues. Because with men of other t tongues and other lips will he speak to this people that's what the apostle paul said in first corinthians 14. so he's going to speak the word of god to people of multiple languages that has to be interpreted that has to be translated and that is one of the gifts of the spirit is the translation of an unknown tongue so yes i believe god preserved the Bible, and God translated the Bible correctly. And when it came down to chapter and verses, I think God had a hand in that as well. God oversaw and was the governor of everything about this book that we have. Everything about it is in order. It's perfect. I can't say it any, any more than what I've said it, but I'm going to continue to say it. This Bible is perfect. So, but what, um, what Genesis 5 shows you is death. Now, why didn't it go to Genesis 5? There. Because you have the same, after you have uh, Seth being born, we have Seth mentioned one time, Seth mentioned two times, Seth mentioned three times, four times, five times, and all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And Enos lived 930 years and begat Canaan. And Enos lived after he begat Canaan 815 years and begat sons and daughters. So then we have Enos. So we have Enos here, Enos here. It skips it here. We have Enos here. We have Enos here. And the fifth time Enos' name is mentioned, 905 years, and he died. Uh, and it's that way with Canaan. It's that way with Mahalalel. It's that way with uh, Jared. It's that day. It's that way. Enoch breaks that pattern. Um, in verse eighteen, Jared lived one hundred and sixty-two years and begat Enoch. So there's Enoch's first mention. Jared lived after he begat Enoch. 
800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. And Enoch... Uh, uh oh, it broke the pattern. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, if you don't understand what that means, we have a double witness to that. It's in the book of Hebrews, it's in chapter 11, what we call the Faith Hall of Fame. And it says that in verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated. He was translated. He was transformed from his physical earth body to his spiritual body. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to I'm going to throw something at you and you get ready to duck but I w I want you to I want you to ponder something there's a there are there are guesses and there are theories about who the two witnesses are in the book of Revelation uh chapter uh, 12, I think, chapter 11, something like that, who the two witnesses are. Some say they are Elijah and Moses, because those are the two men that showed up, Matthew 17, um, to witness Christ's transfiguration. Some say it is Enoch and Elijah, because those are the two men who have not died, uh, but have been taken to heaven. Okay? Um, can, I, can I throw out a theory to you that it's not any of those? that it's not Moses, and it's not Enoch, and it's not Elijah. Now, I don't have a replacement. And let me just say this. Where God is silent, let us be silent. He does not say who the two witnesses are and there may be there may be churches who have established this as their part of their doctrinal statement and if you don't believe it you can't join their church I, I don't know that but it's possible but I'm just saying what if it's not any of those three men what if the two witnesses of the book of Revelation are neither Enoch and Elijah or Elijah and Moses. When you think of Enoch and Elijah, the Bible says Enoch has been translated. When it says Enoch was translated that he should not see death. To me, that means he's not ever going to die. But the two witnesses clearly die. They clearly do. And is it possible that the two witnesses are not two characters from the Bible anywhere but they are just two men that God raises up in the last days to be witnesses for his 
for his kingdom, for his purpose. Is it possible that it could be that way? Just give you something to think about. But anyway, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. How can you please God? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. People, I promise you. No, 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 no. God just promised you that if you will seek after him, he will reward you for that. He will bless you as a result of that. He'll not let you lay in ignorance. He will give you answers. Now, it may take a while, but in due season, he will open your eyes to things, things that you've wondered about for years, and you will worship him. You will praise him. I've uh, been speaking different places and i tell people jeremiah 33 3 is still my favorite verse call unto me and i will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not and i have asked god questions and god has answered those questions right out of the bible i still have questions that i've been asking god for years that he has not answered yet but i believe that he will when it's time for him to do it, when when he has brought me to a place where I've uh, achieved a certain knowledge, then God will tell me something that I've been asking him to tell me for 10, 15, 20 years. That's what I believe. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Genesis chapter 5 it, it represents death. Um, what was created on day five of creation? Third day, fourth day. Ah. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. God created great, great whales. Can you think of a story that has a great whale in it. Yes. Jonah. And it's a picture of the crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, um, yeah. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Whew. And he's preaching to those spirits down there in that prison. He's preaching to those in Abraham's bosom. He's preaching to those in hell. This is what he's doing. That's from Genesis 40. Um, let's see here. Back to Genesis 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we also have another per. Oh, oh uh, Pastor Wayne Dinwiddie showed me this. This is interesting. The name Methuselah. Remember how old Methuselah lived? He lived 969 years on this earth. Uh, let's see here. Let's do a search for Methuselah. Let's see here. I don't know, I can't remember exactly how 
he did that But in, in one place, it ended up being like the 969th word of the Bible. No. Let me try that one again. No, no, can't find it. Anyway, all right. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Genesis chapter 5, 5 represents death. However, however, we have an event that's going to take place that will break the power of death. And it is called, we call it the resurrection, the first resurrection. We call it the translation. We call it the rapture. It is, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then uh, we which are alive and remain, that's five things that happens, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord Wherefore, once again, comfort one another with these words. Not fight one another, not try to beat up one another, not cast one another away from you because their theory of the rapture is different than your theory of the rapture is. We're not supposed to do that. I have friends in the ministry who do not agree with my position on the rapture. When I believe it's going to happen, we don't make it an issue between us. We are friends. We love one another. We care about one another. I, I would not in a billion years for a million dollars go in their church and try to usurp their their pastor's authority in teaching something that is against what their pastor has taught them about the rapture. I would not do that ever. We're to comfort one another with these words. My goodness, people, we have enough enemies out there without making of our of ourselves enemies. We don't need to make enemies of our brethren. We need our friends. We need our brethren. So quit trying to fight everybody about what you think or when you think the rapture is going to take place. Comfort people with those words. The Lord is coming to raise us up one of these days. He's going to change our mortal bodies into immortality. and We're going to live sin free forever. Man, I tell you what, I'm getting close here to getting my... Uh, Sound effects up. Hang on one second. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Got it. Uh, the same pattern. Same pattern is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Same pattern. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15... He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Five things. Again, five things. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We mentioned Enoch. We also have Elijah, who was translated from earth to heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2. And I want you to notice that we have 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. 
Anybody who sees something afar off, they're looking into the future. The future is afar off. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and, and afar off he saw Mount Moriah, which was Golgotha, the place of the skull. And that is the exact place where he offered up Isaac is the same place where Christ was crucified. The Bible says he opened up his eyes and, and saw, a, saw the place afar off. Those of you who want to know what is going to happen in this world, which do you think, this is a, this is a quiz question here, in your, in your opinion, which do you think is a better indicator of when things are going to happen? The internet or the Bible? Which is better? It's going to be the Bible every time. The Bible is going to tell us when things are going to happen. When Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, the Bible is going to remind us Jesus is coming quickly. In fact, he's coming very quickly. Get ready. The Bible is going to be that for us. It's going to be that lamp in the darkness so that we can see our way through to the end. And you're not going to depend on the internet anymore. In fact, well, I won't get in. I, maybe I'll get into that just a little bit. It may come down to the only way you can have access to the internet is to have some sort of mind implant. To get information from Google or for Google to get information from you. Which one is it? Who's Googling who here? Um, but you have 50 men of the sons of the prophets. 50. Five. The number five is there. Watching as Elijah goes up into heaven. Um. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. These were angels. Think of, um, think of plasma. Think of, think of a fire that does not consume a bush. That kind of fire. And you have this horse, you have this chariot, whose substance is literally made of glowing light. And a certain amount of heat. It's, it's absolutely amazing to me. I would love to ride this chariot. And, f and now I believe, I believe that it's very possible, according to uh, Matthew, when he says in verse 25, or chapter 25, chapter 24 is what I meant, that um, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall, shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken 
and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory, great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together all his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And I believe it's possible that God is going to do exactly what he did for Elijah, that he's going to send chariots down to pick us up and take us all up into heaven in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be awesome? Okay? That, that would outdo any sort of um, Hollywood thing. That would outdo any sort of presidential meeting where they, you know, come rolling in in these multi-million dollar vehicles. We're going to be riding in a fiery chariot taken into heaven by God's horses and chariots, just like Elijah was. I think that I think that will be awesome. I think that's I think that's what it's going to be. It's going to be awesome. All right, back to Genesis. Uh, let's go to Genesis six. What's the meaning of the number six? Well, let's look at it. There's a couple of meanings here. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now there's an interesting statement in Matthew 24. When he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And the only marriages that you really see here in the days that were before the flood were the marriages of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, again, I'm, uh, I, I, I like to just prove all things, hold fast that which is good. For those of you who have a problem comprehending the idea that these sons of God were angelic beings, let me remind you of what exactly the Bible says and what the Bible never says. The Bible never says one time, not once, that the sons of Seth were the sons of God. It never says that anywhere ever it does not say that nowhere besides that if you believe that the sons of God were merely the sons of Seth who married the daughters, uh, the, the pretty daughters of men, how does that produce a gigantic, super humanoid being who can grow to in excess of 18 to 20, possibly 30 feet tall, can um, carry the weight of a 30 foot tall person because they're not just tall, 
they're big. Big men. Like Hulk big. And apparently very, very strong. Apparently they are. So it doesn't explain it. And this is probably why the NIV, the New American Standard, the New English Version, no longer translates the word, the Hebrew word Nephilim in um, verse 4, where it says, There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Verse 4, if you look it up in the NIV, it says the Nephilim were in the earth in those days. But it will not tell you nor identify what the Nephilim were. The King James does. King James is the only Bible that does it right. It accurately tells you what these men were. They were giants on the earth at that time humongous creatures, beasts in their nature. That's who they were. This, and the theory of the generation of Seth mating with the fair daughters of men does not account for their humongous size does not account for that. So let's look. That's what the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say ever. And I got into an argument with a pastor one time several years ago down at Bible camp. And I said, what verse is that? I said, that's not in the Bible. He said, yeah, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, come on, Mike. I said, is it in the Bible? If it's in the Bible, you would have read it to me already. But it's not there. And you can't find it there. So let's do this. Sons of God. And by the way, this, this has everything to do with the meaning of the number six. So we have the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6, 2, Genesis 6, 4. We don't have another mention until Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Job 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Job 38, 7 says, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. It's telling you that the sons of God are the morning stars. Where were you when the morning stars sang together? Where were you when the sons of God shouted for joy? This is the Bible's way of, of connecting the two ideas together. The sons of God are the morning stars, and stars are always angels. But then not only that, you have the, um, you have the reference of Psalm 82. Let me get right there, where God said, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. <laughs> children of the Most High are sons of God, and sons of God are are gods. That's another one. Bum, bum, bum. 
That's how it is. Sons of God are gods. Now, then it skips over to the, the New Testament. And every, every place in the New Testament where the phrase sons of God is mentioned, it puts us in that category as Christians. John 1, uh, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. 1 John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Something like that. I think that's how it goes. Behold what manner of love the Father hath, be, hath given unto us. Something like that. that. That we should be called the sons of God. Now, John 3, 1 John 3, 2 says it this way. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So we don't know what our actual new body is going to appear like, but when it appears, it's going to be full of glory. It's going to be full of, uh, I, I believe that, that we'll be made of fire, That's what our DNA is. It's phosphorus. Sugar and phosphorus. Which both light up. They burn brightly. Okay? So to me that the the argument is is it's over with. There can be no other biblical interpretation for who these sons of gods were or sons of God were there can be no other biblical interpretation than and see when we when we are taken into heaven Jesus said we shall be as the angels in heaven who are neither married nor are given in marriage. And that is true. So what happened was, you have a group of angels that left their first estate in heaven, came down to this earth, fell left their first estate. God, I believe, mortalizing them because he says in uh, Psalm 82, 6, I've said, ye are gods and all of you children of the Most High, yet ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. I actually quoted it before I could get to it, but that's what it says. But these angels... Sons of God mated. And, and then you have uh, 1 Corinthians 15 shedding a little bit of light, I believe, on this issue. Um. Verse 37, that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or, or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. Notice that there are four of them. Flesh of men, flesh of beasts, fishes, and of birds. Four. 
It's referring to a spiritual kingdom. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Talking about how bright one is over another. So the idea that angels don't have seed, well, God clears that up here. That if it has a body... It has seed that made that body. Now, uh, just as a side note, every, every single abductee Someone who has claimed that they have had missing time and under hypnotic regression has told the story that they can see themselves on a ship and they see all these little gray creatures with big almond-shaped eyes using instruments, very painful procedure in many ways. To extract um, seed from the male and the female. There is no doubt in my mind that a hybridiz hybridization program is in place right now. Now, what they're waiting on to perfect, I don't know. But that that takes you to Daniel chapter 2, what, what ends up being the big secret that not even Nebuchadnezzar could know, but only Daniel. And Daniel knew it only because God showed it to him. He said in verse 43, um, Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And my friends... That's what I believe the, the plan is, the program. Hybridization. Just like in Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they bear children unto them, and these men were absolutely huge. Apparently, they learned how to genetically modify their vegetables because if you remember when the 12 spies went into Canaan, two of them came back carrying a cluster, one cluster of grapes on a pole between the two men. Now that, that was either the most amazing thing they had ever seen or it was the most silly thing they'd ever seen. Why did you put that little cluster of grapes on that big pole? Well, I don't think it was a little cluster of grapes. I think it was a great, big, huge, giant cluster of grapes. Um, back at the ranch, Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at uh, another meeting of... Another meaning of the number six, as found in Genesis 6. Um, 
Let's see here. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Uh, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. That's basically tar. He's sealing the boat with tar to make it waterproof. Um, this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. It's basically a big shoebox. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of, the, breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. If you look at the three Fibonacci numbers, they are there in that length, uh, or excuse me, length, width, and depth of the ark. So Moses and his three sons, four men, four men, think about it. Four men end up being the saviors. It's a foreshadowing of what we're going to see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Christ coming to save us from the flood of ungodliness that is coming to this world one of these days. Although it's not a flood of water, it's going to be a flood of fire that's going to be poured out on this earth one of these days. Are you ready for that day? I hope you are. I hope you are. I, I am. I am. And I like, I like being ready. I like I like being ready. I don't like going, God, I know I got sins in my life and I don't want to confess them because I want to keep doing them. I don't like that. I want to be ready, bags packed, ready to go, in the twinkling of an eye, I want to go. And I hope you do too. So, um... When we look at what Noah's doing here, the Bible tells us that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, that the ark was a preparing. So, and how old was Noah when he stepped on the ark? He was 600 years old. The number six has to do with preparation. Let me show you an, an, another, um, another reference to that. Revelation, let's see if I can find it. Chapter 9, I believe. Yeah. Verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, even which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Um, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, of jacinth, of brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and, brim, and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of, out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and the heads with them um, 
they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornications nor of their thefts. So this, this angel... Um, or these four angels in verse 15 were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And that happened when the sixth trumpet sounded. Sixth trumpet sounded and the four angels that were prepared to come out of the river Euphrates for a hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. One third. Listen. To all of you who think Anthony Fauci is trying to kill everybody on the earth, let me remind you that when this when these four angels are released by god sounding the trumpet the sixth trumpet a third of the human population is wiped out gone think about that Think about it. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be kindly honest with some of you. And it's because I love you. Kindly honest. But I do not see Satan having having a plan to rid the earth of a majority of its population. The plans that I see Satan involved in are have to do with sitting in the sea of seat of God in the midst of the seas and making merchandise off of the souls of men. That's what I see happening. But I, I do not I don't read the Georgia Guidestones and interpret them as Bible prophecy. I don't. And I won't. That's not what God called me to do. It's not what God called me to do. All right, so the number six, and, and let me throw this in about the number six in preparation. Remember John the Baptist. Do you know how many months it was um, after he was born that Jesus was born? Six months, exactly. Six months. John preceded Jesus by six months. And what was it said of John? It was said that he will go and prepare the way of the Lord. Make ready his coming. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. 
John the Baptist was to go before Christ to prepare the way for the Messiah. Isn't that something? Somebody get happy, say amen. So that's just, that's the number six. That's what you can find out. Uh, now, Genesis 7. That should be easy. Easy peasy. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark for thee. Have I seen righteous before me in this, congr in this generation? And of every clean beast, thou shalt take to these by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, and the male and female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Now God says it in Genesis 7 that he's giving an announcement to Noah that in seven days I'm going to do this. Now my question is, will you and I receive such a notice? Would, will you and I receive such a notice? I think it's, I think it's possible. I think it's possible that you and I are going to get a notice. If we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 2, we get a really good understanding of the number 7. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the, on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day. God sanctified the seventh day. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. What, what did Paul do on the seventh day? He rested. What did John do? He rested. And those of you who can't handle that, I'm telling you, nowhere in the scripture, nowhere in the scriptures anywhere does it um, command us to only go to church on one day of the week and forbids us from going to church to worship God on any other day of the week. There, there is no, there's nothing. There's nothing like, there's no commandment like that. Doesn't exist. But it, he did say rest. And I try to do that. Uh, but anyway, this is the, the meaning of the number seven. He ended his work. Uh, he says, that, I'm done. I've, I've had it. It's enough. Man's gone too far. On and on and on and on. So I got, I got to kill everybody. So back in the ranch, chapter seven. Uh, let's see here. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years when the flood of waters was upon the earth. 
See, he was preparing. But now that he's 600 years, he can get on the ark. He doesn't, there's no more time to prepare. It's over with. The ark is built. The tar has been plastered on there. And they're ready to go. Um, verse 7, And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of the beasts that were not clean, of fowls and of every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two uh, and two unto Noah un into the ark, the male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. After seven days. Uh, seven is that number for perfection and completion. And I'm done is, is sort of how God would put it. Um, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt uh, preserve them from this generation forever. So why, why wouldn't the Bible say the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified four or five times? Because that's not what four or five means. Seven means that, and all the Jews knew that. They knew what seven meant. It was God's peculiar number. Um, it is a prime number. It means it can't be divided by anything without having to carry stuff out and have decimals and everything like that. It's a prime number. Um... But it means finished, completed, and so on. So if we go to Exodus chapter, let's see, no, Exodus chapter 20. It looks odd, but you see here that we are in the 70th chapter of the Bible. God's, and notice the count of these words. Three, four, five, six, seven. Seven words there. And God spake all these words, saying. And the Holy Ghost asked me one day, Mike, do you believe that? And I knew what he, I knew what he meant. Mike, do you believe that I say all of those words in English for you? Not Hebrew, not Greek, but do you believe that I speak these words to you? Logic and reasoning told me, yes, I believe it. And once I believed it, then I believed that everything that I read in my Bible, God spake all of those words. Now, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But God spake all of these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the beginning of the commandments, the Ten Commandments. Um, I'm not going to read all of those today. Uh, let's go back to the ranch here. Genesis chapter 7. God gives Noah a seven-day time prophecy. A week. 
said, no, I'm giving you a week. Get everything tidied up. Get your wife, your husband, your sons, your husbands. <laughs> get your, get your, your wife, your sons, their wives, all, all eight of you. Get in the ark. And uh, and and just sit there. Just sit there. Don't do anything. Because God is going to shut the door of the ark. God is going to do that, my friends. Now, when it comes time for God to start pouring out his stuff on this earth, wherever we are at that time, I wouldn't plan on getting another chance because I'm here to tell you that on that day, God's already made up his mind who's going to heaven and who's not going to heaven. And if he's made up his mind that you've been playing around, you've been uh, just playing games with God. God, I'll get right one of these days. God, I promise I'll get right one of these days. God's had enough of you making dry, empty promises. Boom. God says, I'll shut the door of the ark. Slam. Now the door of the ark is shut. Nobody can go in. Nobody can fall out. Think about that. Somebody say amen. Once you're in the ark, can you fall out? No. Not possible. He didn't tell Noah to stand outside on the ledge of the ark and hang on now, Noah. Hang on. It's going to be a year. It's going to be a rough ride. You better hang on. He didn't tell him that. Noah was in Christ. The ark was Christ. Noah was in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Aren't you glad? God gave you a new life to start all over with. No more of the old stuff you have to mess with anymore. God cleaned you up, made you a new person. And now, now, you like God's people and God's people like you. And it didn't used to be that way, did it, for some of you. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I love you guys. I do. I thank God for you. You're the reason why I do what I do. Thank you for praying for us. Um, we are making plans. We just got a call here a while back. We're going to be headed to Fort Smith, Arkansas um, on November. Let's see here. November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. I think it's the first Free Will Baptist Church of Fort Smith, Arkansas, November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Um, so if you're in the area, like to come by and see us. Pastor Ernie Embrill is the pastor there. I'm sure he'd I'm sure he'd love to have you. So so come see us and pray for us. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. God bless you. We'll see you.